Wonderful. Well, welcome everybody. It is January 27th. We're here for our um, Citizen Oversight Committee. Um, and at this time, I'd like to call the meeting to order and it's uh, 535. Uh, I think we would, um, we should start with the Pledge of Allegiance. If we all would stand, do we have a cute little flag coming up, Scott? We do. We, we even yeah. have a, uh... We even have a video, I believe. Oh, wonderful. Okay, well, if we get that, get, then. If I get to it, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, wonderful. All right. So, I pledge allegiance to the flag oh, wait, of the wait, United wait. States of America uh, and to the Republic flag of, the of which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You did that better than uh, Alex de Leon did yesterday. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, thank you for that video. Um, all right. Well, first, let me start with saying um, Happy New Year to everyone. It's nice to see that everyone is here. Um, looks like all of our members as far as roll call are present and OUSD staff if I could have who is not let's see who are our guests Scott who are in the audience sure so we have one guest today uh it is uh from Jeff from Nigro Nigro um okay. he is going to be giving the um audit report for us this evening on the measure s program okay. for Wonderful. for 1920. okay all right, that, that sounds wonderful. And is Rory on the, is Rory here? Yes, Rory Lorenzo yep. should be on the line. Okay, all right. Yep. So yep. Wanted yep. To make sure. All right, well, at this time, um, I'd like to allow time here for public comments. Were there any public comments that were submitted? None at this time. We did not receive any comments. Okay, is there any public comment that any of the directors would like to um, address at this time? All right, well, we'll close the public comment at this time and then we will move on to the approval of the agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Right. Thank you very much. All right, well, we have uh, two sets of minutes that need to be approved. Uh, the first one is July 15th, and the second is October 21st. Do we have any changes or corrections uh, or any discussion on any of those? Move right, approval see. for both. Second. Thank you. We have a first and we have a second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Aye for Thank the first one. All right. Item number seven is proposed dates uh, for our oversight committee. Uh, we have the dates of April 22nd, July 29th, and October 28th. Are there any, is there any discussion, any objections to these dates? I just want to clarify something as well that um, these uh, these dates are is basically the extension of four um, four meetings a year because obviously we're having one here in January, um, but it's 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 uh, up to the, the committee whether or not they want to continue with the four meetings a year. I think the district has um, has enjoyed having the opportunity to speak to this committee four times a year, so we're fine with keeping the dates. But we wanted to just say that the the mandate is once per year at least. But um, I think since we're right into Measure S, we, we believe that we have a lot to show you so we can continue with the dates, but it's completely up to the committee. I'm fine with the meetings. Yeah. They're not yes. that intrusive and I, I like the updates when I get asked questions. Yeah, I agree. Once we get through with phase two, it may be a different story, but right now I think it's good to meet four times a year. Yeah. Yep. Entry. Until the projects get more completed, I think we need to be updated. All right. I'm good uh, with it. Good with that also. So do I have uh, a motion to accept these dates? So moved. Second. Wonderful. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you very much for that. All right. And we're going to move on now then to Jeff 
from um, Nigro Nigro, and he is going to review the audit report for us and give us a presentation. Hi, welcome. Thank you. It, it's my pleasure. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to present the audit to you tonight. Um, first of all, I, as as you already said, my name is Jeff Nigro. I'm one of the founding partners at Nigro Nigro. Um, I've just been um, just about at my 30 year anniversary of doing school district audits. Wow. So I'm, I've been been around a little bit. <laughs> I had hair when I started. Um, <laughs> And, I think a lot uh, of people might say that. So the first nine years of my career, I worked at another CPA firm uh, before starting Nigro Nigro, and for the last 21 years, we've been doing K-12 school district audits and numerous of these types of uh, financial and performance audits, um, thanks to Prop 39, which, as you know, <laughs> spurred this whole thing. So um, before I get into the actual audit itself, I just want to talk briefly about the financial and performance audit is mean. The financial audit is similar to the district audit. It's it's where the auditor gives an independent opinion of the financial statement. So we look at the building fund, which is the fund where the bond proceeds are deposited, and we give an opinion about whether those financial statements are prepared in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles, which we call GAAP. And so auditors can give different types of opinions on those financial statements. And the opinion that we're giving in this report is what's called unmodified, which, which is a clean opinion. That's the one you want. You, you don't want it with exceptions where, you know, everything's correct except for this. So it's a clean, uh, unmodified opinion on the financial statements. Um, since we're into the report, um, you know, we have an introductory page, but the financial statements actually begin on the uh, page four of the report. And again, this is for the 2019-20 fiscal year. So the balance sheet you see is simply a snapshot of uh, in time as of June 30th, 2020. And uh, at the time there were uh, over $108 million in the fund balance available in the building fund. And then the following page is the schedule of revenues and expenditures, which show the activity that occurred during the 1920 fiscal year. So you see that almost $53 million was spent and leaving $108 million at the end of the year. Now, following the financial statements, if you're really into accounting, this is exciting stuff. We get into the notes to the financial statements, which really give you a lot of detail, a lot of background information, talks about the type of accounting used in, in the fund, uh, that it uses modified accrual because it's a governmental fund. Um, there's different things about um, the bonds themselves and just some other footnote disclosures. And um, then we have a report that begins on page 11. It's a report that basically says that we followed generally accepted government auditing standards, which is required. Uh, I see somebody's hand up. Uh, a quick question on the uh, on the notes. Um, yes. My background is in banking, and the and the first two things we always look at is the notes and the and the opinion, uh, usually in that order. Um, did you you went over the notes with the uh, administration of the school district? Uh, yes. The school board. Yes. And they were they, uh, then they were, the board, all, yeah. they were no. fine with them. They were okay with them. Uh, we have not reviewed this information with the board yet, but we did with the district administration. Okay, and they were okay with the notes? And, uh, yes. And, okay, very good. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I, I don't mean to brush over anything too quickly, so if, I, if there's anything you want to go over, just let me know. Um, the, the report on page 11, as I was saying, is the report that says that we followed government, uh, generally accepted government auditing standards which is required for this type of an audit. Um, it just basically means that in addition to looking at the financial statements, we also look at internal controls and we look at compliance with uh, laws and regulations that could have a material impact on the financial statements. And those, that letter basically says that if we found anything out of compliance or if we found any areas of internal control weaknesses, we would report them to you in this report as findings. Uh, the final two pages of the report, 
address the performance audit. Now I talked about what the financial audit is. The performance audit only takes up two pages in the report, but it is where we spend most of the time in the audit, significantly more time here. <laughs> Um, the performance audit is what most of you think of when you're thinking of the uh, audit of the bond funds and 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 you'll see that um, you know the objectives and the scope and everything and then on the last page we talk about the actual procedures we performed so the the biggest thing that we do in the performance audit is to select a sample of expenditures out of the bond funds uh, yes I have a question. When you selected the samples, were they from all four of the school sites? Um, I would have to look at the actual work paper to determine that. Um, if you would like to hold on a minute, I can check. Um, but I know that our, san our sample selects, um, our methodology generally selects larger items, but then there's also a random component so that smaller items would be uh, in the pool as well in the population to be selected. And we try not to pick repeating expenditures. For example, if we've tested one expenditure made to a contractor, we don't test, you know, if you're paying that contractor quarterly, we're not going to test all four of those same items because they're generally going to be low risk at that point. Um, and um, we picked our sample selection included expenditures from Orange, High School, Canyon, Villa Park, um, El Modena. Yes, so I think all four were represented. So did you know the percentage the, of the, the uh, in, in your note took um, with regards to the bidding process procedures? Yes. With the percent, you know, the percentage of the sampling that you did? Uh, in terms of testing contracts, is that what you're asking? Yes. Um, I couldn't give you a percentage, but we looked at uh, eight different contracts um, for El Medina High, Orange, Villa Park, Canyon, Fred Kelly Stadium. So we looked at a number of different contracts. And just to clarify, Bill, um, when we, this is Scott Harvey, when we did the bidding for the projects, it was done in the previous um, fiscal year. So you won't probably see the larger bids, but you will see contract amendments and things like that in their audit. So, uh, you know, once we get into phase two, you will see the, the bidding process again in probably 21, 22. Would that include uh, change orders, Scott? Uh, change orders. I don't. I, I think that's part of the of the financial report. You'll see that it's more or less the same contract. There's no additional bidding for that. If we did go over the threshold of 10% and there was a bidding process, then you would most likely see that in the audit because it's really one significant thing. So we would point that out and include it in the audit for the auditors. Right. And we we do look at uh, we do look at change orders if those come through. So in your uh, in your notes, you say that you tested approximately twenty six point eight million dollars in invoices. How many invoices did that represent? You know, if you if I were live, I wouldn't be able to answer these questions right off the top of my head the way I'm doing because I have the luxury of having my audit binder in front of me. Um, there were thirty three expenditures sampled in our. Um, I surprise that. If I could ask a question, um, you mentioned just now in response to another question, you mentioned Fred Kelly Stadium, but Fred Kelly is outside of Measure S. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would like a little more detail on what was looked at there also. Okay, well our sample selection included uh, looking at eight different contracts. And um, some, as you may or may not know, uh, our firm is also doing the annual audit for, for the district as a whole. So some of our work may have overlapped. So we may have included that in, in the eight, which if it's not part of the Measure S project, then, uh, then we tested seven. How are we, how are we 
be assured that the other seven were actually attributed to Measure S, uh, given the fact that there were only eight and one was a Kelly Stadium contract uh, leads me to that question. Okay, well, um, El Medina High School Science Center, Orange High School Science Center, Villa Park High School Science Center, Canyon High School Science Center, um, and then three more for Villa Park as well um, for smaller items. So the uh, uh, I can help answer that. So in our ledger, everything to do with uh, Measure S is under Fund 21, which is what the state mandates. Everything that is related to Kelly Stadium was either paid by developer fees, which is Fund 25, or contributions from coming from Fund 40, which is a which is a separate fund, which is a capital outlay fund. There were no expenditures of Kelly Stadium that were under Fund 21. So was it just an error that an extra contract was uh, audited? Well, it, I wouldn't say it was an error. It was sure. probably audited as part of the school district audit. Um, probably yeah. just included in our work paper here by mistake. So when it comes to the expenditures, then can you give us an idea of what expenditures you audited that you looked at to make sure that to kind of assure us that you didn't uh, look at Kelly Stadium expenditures? Right. Well, um, I, I'm looking at the list right now and there's nothing, nothing for that project. Everything was for the four high schools that I read to you earlier. Um, they're all under Fund 21. And they are all for science centers for Orange, Canyon, Villa Park, Almudena, um, and then some other. Um, it's the same school, some other projects besides the science center. Mr. Negro, can you uh, uh, can you uh, relay the vendors that you were looking at? Uh, I can uh, for the contracts or for the expenditure testing. Well, for whatever you whatever you were reading off just now. Yes, um, Kinner Construction, Swinerton Builders, Angelus Contractor. Um, there's some. There's several repeats. Like there's some here for um, different. Um, let's see, Angel uh, Cordoba Corporation, uh, Nino and more, Elite Modular. Harley Ellis Devereaux, Uri Engineering, LPA. And uh, as I said, many of them are, are repeats. So the names that he's been reading off, it's either an architect for the site, the contractor that was awarded that project, or some of the <laughs> contracts, or some of the uh, contractors that we hired, like soil engineer. So those are the ones, those are the vendors that he's reading off. And were the, um, there was no crossover between the vendors on the Fred Kelly site and the other sites? No. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the the second to the last paragraph in your uh, letter is is the bottom line for us. Right. In our right. opinion, the district yeah. compiled we complied with the compliance requirements for Major S general obligation bond proceeds listed and tested above. Correct? Exactly. I had I just hadn't gotten to that yet, but yes, that's exactly right, and that's. That's the opinion on the performance audit that there was uh, the district was in compliance with everything that we tested. There were no exceptions. Had there been, there would be a, a list of findings and recommendations following this letter. So I just want to go over to you told us there approximately 33 invoices were uh, included. That those 33 invoices were approximately $27 million because it says it got it. One of your, your notes is that you tested approximately $27 million with. Right. And that is 51%. So I just want to make sure that, that that's what it doesn't sound like a lot. 20 you know, to only have that little. But is that correct that those little amount of invoices were 27 million? 
Yes, yeah, several of them, most of them, well, not most, uh, roughly half of them were for over a million dollars. Some were close to two. Um, like I said, many of them are significant, but then some smaller ones um, in our random selection as well. So the total came to 26,833,350 expenditures. Any further comments from anyone regarding the audit? Did you have full cooperation from the staff? Uh, we did. Um, it was an odd year um, trying to do the audit without setting foot in the district, but um, we had cooperation as best as they could manage and uh, they were able to get us everything. We were able to finish this audit prior to even finishing the district audit. We'll say we're very familiar with with file file sharing now. They're yes, process through Suralink, which is the document management system they use for the, this process. So, yes. well, well, good to hear. And the board will be presented with this when. Uh, we are we are uh, thinking March would be the net would be the next date it would be available. The February 11th uh, agenda is pretty much set. Um, so we're going to shoot for March. I think I believe it's March 11th. Is that right, Dave, um, Mr. Rivera, or is there? I'm not. I'm not 100% no, sure. I think I think you are right. It's March 11th. It is. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Unless we have anything else from our committee members to discuss, um, I appreciate it. The audit looks wonderful. Um, Obviously, uh, do, I guess the question is, do we have to send something to the board also, or is this satisfactory for what the board needs? Um, well, I think when we, that will be covered when we have the March presentation, which is the annual presentation um, by a representative of this committee to the board in the annual meeting and the annual updates. David, do we need to do a motion to accept this or approve it to pass on to them so they know that it's legitimately been looked at by our committee? Yes, it does have to be moved on. OK, then I move we accept the report as presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Daniel, uh, hey, just as a, just Diana, as a you're question. going to uh, represent the uh, commission at the board meeting on the 11th of March. I'm sorry, Bill, what did you Is that a question? <laughs> you're going to the represent the committee there at the at the board meeting. Yeah, in the past, as the chair, I have um, presented it to the board, and I'm certainly open to anyone who would like to to take that on. I'd be happy to pass it on. Otherwise, um, I guess I'll be in front of a computer presenting it <laughs> to a new board. I think you've been nominated. OK, I kind of like it doing it from home, so I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I don't have to I wait. Make, too I want to make two points of clarification. So the agenda lists this as an informational item. So Correct. what we'll do in the minutes is adjust this to an action item so that it's clear that it was an action item. So I'm stating for the record today that um, instead of informational, the audit was accepted and voted on by the Citizens Oversight Committee for Measure S. Um, the other point of order, I just wanted to make sure everybody uh, recognized the public link had some issues. So we have since fixed those issues with the public link. Unfortunately, it was during the meeting, so I'm not sure I mean, a couple, maybe five, six minutes into, we we're able to get that live up and running. So what we will do in lieu of that, if people did not join on, we have this recording and we will have the full recording like we had the other months onto the website. And then we'll also have the public comment that will be available and we'll leave it up um, for, for a few weeks. And then we'll be able to answer comments if we get comments on the recording or get general comments. And then our responses will be sent out to the entire COC, um, uh, Citizens Oversight Committee. Sorry, that's the acronym for that. If those are watching, I don't know. But uh, so if that pleases the um, committee, that's how we'll handle it. So sorry about the technical difficulties. As we all know, virtual world can be um, challenging. So, so thank you. Uh, 
it, was that during the point in time where we asked for public comments? Because I'm wondering if there was nobody in yeah. the. Okay. Yeah, so we were asking for public comment, but there really wasn't anybody on. So there may be people on now. So we'll respect that. So those that are listening, please know that there is a public comment form that is live and the link is live so you can join the meeting. Well, obviously, if you're on the meeting, you've joined already, um, but we will record this whole session and have it available for those that want to watch it later, maybe make comments and we will respond to those comments accordingly. Well, I'll, at the end, uh, what we'll do is unless anybody objects after we get done with um, item 10, I'll ask for public comment if anyone is there and see if you've gotten anything in. Um, I think that would be the best. And if anyone's there, they have the opportunity to speak. Or we, you can that's read good, yeah, okay. I, that's very appropriate. Okay, so we'll do that after item 10. We'll just repeat yeah, We're that. seeing a few attendees come in now, so I think that's good. Okay. Mrs. Mrs. Fascinelli? Yes. I would just like to thank our auditor, uh, Mr. Nigro, for his fine work and being diligent and working with us on during these difficult times. I also like to uh, express, express my appreciation to Mrs. Delgado with uh, leading the business team on making sure that everything was there and available and appropriate and complete. So this is year 12 in a row uh, that Ms. Delgado has in the business team of no audit findings. So uh, thank you to the entire team. Thank you. Thank you all for your time. Thank you very much. All right. Good night. Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> if I may address it. Yes. You're on mute. You're muted. Um, just thank you. And also uh, recognize that there is a whole team that normally you see is uh, Mr. Rivera, uh, Mr. Harvey and I, but there is a whole team of committed team members looking at all the paperwork that goes uh, through and to make sure that everything is compliant. So I want to also extend my appreciation for the entire team. Thank you for the few minutes. And that would extend on to the coming team, who's our program manager as well, that helped out uh, put a lot of this information together. So there's Rory. Thank you, yep. Rory, for your team and your efforts in uh, working with Mr. Nigro and his team. I want to get the paper uh, concession for the school district. <laughs> <laughs> OK, all right, so we're going to move on then to Measure S update presentation. You're muted, Scott. Can everybody see that okay? Yep. And you can hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, the last time we uh, met, it was October, and a lot, is, a lot has changed since then. Um, we uh, talked to you a lot at that point about uh, the delays that were happening at Villa Park High School. That was uh, one of the features that we had. So we have an update on that this evening. We also want to show you some pictures of the completed um, uh, Orange High School STEM Center, which you have, uh, most of you have turned, I think all of you have, have toured through, hopefully. If not, we'd be happy to tour you through at any time. So we'll talk a little bit about that and we'll go through um, just in general where we are with some of the delays at El Medina and Villa Park High School, which we'll touch on in more detail. You're muted again, Scott. I'm muted. Yeah. Scott, you're muted. I'm sorry about that. Can everybody hear me now? Yes. I'm so sorry about that. And, they can, and you could see the screen. Can everybody hear me? Yes. OK. Yes, so <laughs> let me go back to this slide. So Orange High School Science Center is now open. Um, it's been completed and uh, it has about 30% of student capacity on campus. So about 30% of the building is basically occupied right now with students during the regular school day, but you have virtual learning going on, of course. So um, it's exciting just to see students in the new building and uh, learning and taking advantage of um, all of the hard work that our community put in on this. Canyon High School Science Center, um, the structural steel is topped out um, in November. Uh, that means uh, topped out means that the, it's about uh, the structural steel portion is completed, which is basically the halfway point 
of the project and is still on schedule to be completed by fall of 21. Uh, El Medina High School has had severe delays, as we've mentioned previously. Um, most of this had to do with um, this, the structural steel being behind as well. It, it happened to be the same con subcontractor that um, the uh, prime contractor, who is ACI for both projects, used. So there were some problems, and that set the other trades behind. However, it has since been um, caught up and um, we are we are trending now to be completed uh, by the summer and open that building in the fall. So uh, we, we're holding the contractor accountable and we have our, our legal counsel involved um, with this project in terms of the liquidated damages. If you don't all know, our contracts cover, uh, carry a $3,000 a day liquidated damages uh, provision. So at this point, um, you know, we were supposed to open here in the fall. So that is just gaining ground and um, you know, it, it, it could equate to several hundred thousands of dollars when it gets um, down to it. So this is a contractual thing that we uh, put into all of our contracts. And it's the same thing with Villa Park High School with the severe delays uh, in the structural steel portion, as some of you may have seen, but some of you also may have seen that has made some pretty good strides uh, because of the delay, we were, um, you know, had very, very, um, I wouldn't say heated, but we had very serious conversations with the contractor to make sure that um, they held the subcontractor uh, accountable. And um, in fact, they were able to remove that subcontractor from both of the jobs and now has been since re been replaced with um, another structural steel contractor that was able to complete um, the fixes and the big problem with Villa Park we'll talk about you know, when we get to that slide. Can I so, tell you, so what is the total delay um, for both El Modena and Villa Park compared to the original schedule? So the original schedule for El Medina High School was a fall opening of this year. So it was going to be open uh, on our trending on the, on the schedule was going to be open in September. Um, so now that equates to, as you can you can imagine, that's up to eight months um, in delay because of, because of um, mainly because of the structural steel being behind. But other uh, con other contractors have also had other issues uh, with COVID-19 and supply chain. But really, that's where it started and kind of set the rest of the trades off. At Villa Park High School, it was, it was set to open about now. Um, in January of, of this year and is now uh, has a June on paper. But these are all things that we are looking at on paper. Uh, we are working with the contract to accelerate our timelines um, and that's uh, where we are now. And so we're waiting for the that acceleration to kick in. As you can see, the acceleration has kicked in at Villa Park and we'll talk about that when we get to the slide. But here's the Science Center um, uh, at, at uh, Orange High School. Uh, Pinner Construction is the contractor, as we know. Um, we had a, a preview tour uh, of the building. Uh, it was done in very small groups, as you, uh, as we alluded to before. Uh, we have six total change orders on the job. We're expecting one more change order, um, if, if I'm correct, Rory, in that. Rory, are you online? He's muted, I believe. Okay, but it is, uh, we're expecting one more change order and to be around the um, 3.1, 3.2. We're not exactly sure, but it's going to be under 5% for sure. And uh, that's a big accomplishment considering all of the uh, unforeseen and other challenges we've had. Excuse me, Scott. Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. I was muted. Um, as of today, it will be two more. Uh, it will okay. be change order nine and then a final change order 10. But we're pretty confident we're going to be under 5%. Yes. And uh, yes, and a lot of it's going to, some of it's going to be credits as well as, as uh, change order items. So that's good to know. Here's some pictures of, of the completed uh, Science Center. Uh, in the classroom, you can see our social distancing in place with the barriers. Um, we have um, a shot of it at night, which is a beautiful thing for the community to see. The Panther there uh, and our restrooms. We thought we'd include that picture as you can see how large and accommodating they are for our students. And it doesn't look like a school restroom, does it? It kind of looks like a, a restroom you'd find at a, at a, um, a nice, uh, uh, like a nice mall or something like that. But this is a, 
is great for our kids. It's colorful and it's not so um, institutional looking. So that's great. Villa Park, as we move on, as we as we alluded to the um, uh, the delay, uh, we have since seen framing and um, decking start. Decking is actually um, close to being completed, actually, and framing starting on the building. Um, and then pretty soon the roof will be uh, poured as well, and that will dry in the building. And once the building is dried in, uh, the acceleration will really kick in. Um, just to let you know kind of where we were trending, in November, I think we had a manpower of about 15 to 20 people at the job site. Now we're up around 50 to 60 people a day working on the building. So you can see that the contractor is trying. Uh, we did hold their feet to the fire to do some kind of acceleration, and we have um, been very um, vocal with them about continuing to update the plan if there are any slippages or any problems that would derail from that schedule. So here's what, some pictures. What day is Villa Park at as far as delays? With uh, using that number of three thousand dollars, what day are they at? Well, we're waiting. Uh, we're waiting for uh, an official kind of accept acceptance of an acceleration schedule. But their current schedules are trending towards um, the middle of the summer, so probably around July, which um, we would like to improve upon, and and hopefully in June we could. Um, start moving things into the building and occupying and start to uh, get our classrooms ready. That's the goal at this point. So you could see that would be about five uh, to six months of delay. And have they begun making those payments or is that something that'll just be withheld from them? No, we, we would continue to, to pay for what uh, Mr. Rivera can add on to this too, but we would continue to pay what we see in the pay apps, which are the invoices for the contractor, but our retention is 5%. Um, on all of these projects. So our goal is to keep the contractor uh, moving forward and keep the project funded so that their contractors can get paid and, and move forward on this acceleration with the understanding that we do have a retention um, at the end of the project. Thank you. So here's some pictures of the um, Villa Park building. You can see it has made lots of progress. It has a second floor poured now. Uh, there's a lot more framing that's uh, even in these pictures that have happened over the last uh, week or so. Um, I also put a picture of the front. You can actually see from the roof uh, here, um, the vantage point of the roof, the um, uh, marquee that's been installed and the VP um, monument letters that were installed that really add a little flair and, and um, identification for the site. Mr. Miller is very excited. Um, the pickup drop off is much improved. Unfortunately, we can't we don't have a, a big use of it yet. Um, there is some pick up and drop up going on, but not at the level that uh, it was when school was in full swing before the pandemic. El Medina High School, as we mentioned before. Um, go ahead, I'm sorry. Was there a question? Uh, Scott, if nobody else does, I do. I, I thought you were gonna explain a little more about what happened with the structural steel specifically. Nobody sure. has said what went wrong, so I'm just curious. Yeah, and I want to point out that there is a, because, you know, just in the interest of time, but um, there's a whole video that we did with Kathy Moffitt that's on our website, and I believe that we sent it out to the group as well via email that explains in detail, it's actually a half hour video or even longer that goes into the details, but I can touch on that. So basically what happened was the structural steel con subcontractor um, performed the steel work in, in non-conformance with the plans. They deviated from the plans. They, they built it to the way they usually would build it in that situation, but they missed some details on the plans. These aren't major details, meaning the actual structure wasn't unsafe or it wasn't um, a, an issue that was going to have to be ripped, where structural steel was gonna have to be ripped out in order to be redone. But there's a lot of different plates and um, uh, uh, little little uh, joint um, of welding that goes on with plates that was done incorrectly. So, and the contractor was tasked with making all these fixes. When we have these projects, we have a lot of individuals involved on our end, meaning we have support staff that does inspection. And that inspector is not a staff member, but is a consultant that's hired that it has a DSA license to do inspections. So that's our DSA inspector for this project. And the DSA inspector, the inspector, when they have 
issues with the project that doesn't follow the plan exactly, they write what's called a deviation notice. Uh, and this, this site had roughly around 100 deviation notices in the structural fields. Uh, the contractor was tasked to, to fix these items before they could move forward. Um, and they struggled mightily in fixing the items because of one reason or another. So we gave them months to fix these items and to get back on track and they failed to do so. So we reached out to the, to the contractor and said, we don't believe that your subcontractor can finish these items and that um, you, you know, need to look into potentially either supplementing or replacing the contractor. Um, but you know, obviously that's a process in that. They, they have to substitute a contractor within our contract system. So they have to go through a hearing process if the subcontractor that's doing the work currently um, decides they don't want to get off the job. But in this case, we were able to, uh, you know, the, the, we were able to get past that without a hearing because the subcontractor, um, you know, basically waived their right to a hearing and, um, jump, and remove themselves from the job and were replaced by another contractor. So that's basically what happened. And, and those hundred, um, just to give you some perspective, the hundred deviations only got down to about 80. So they're only able to fix about 20 in three to four, three months of time, which is very disappointing. So R&D, who is the new subcontractor has been brought in, um, has now fixed uh, 78 of the 80, or, or I'm sorry, um, 68 of the 80 and uh, we have about 12 items that were on the books and it may have been even been less by the end of this week. I think by the end of this week we're looking to have zero um, uh, deviations and these deviations aren't now are not holding us back from doing the decking and doing the other things and the inspector has, moved, has allowed the job to move forward in the framing process and, and otherwise because all the major fixes that needed to be done to get to those stages have been done. So I hope hopefully that answers the question. Thank you, Scott. And you have the same, same situation at Villa at El Medina, is that correct, Scott? Yeah, El Medina is a little bit different. They were able to actually finish. Um, the issue with El Medina was that the steel made it to the site, but it didn't have the correct markings. So somewhere they halfway through the job, the contractor had moved their steel operations to out of the country. Um, to to um, uh, Tijuana, Mexico, and that's uh, it's done a lot. Um, but in this case, we we were a little bit concerned, but the contractor assured us any costs associated would be covered um, by them in terms of the inspection. So we sent a special inspector down there. All was done well in the factory, but when it was uh, sent over, um, it was galvanized before it was sent, and a lot of the markings on the steel were painted over. So we had to take a painstaking time to send our own support staff, um, in this case, our lab of record that does the special testing over to verify all of the steel, that it met the requirements, that it was cut the right size, that it was that it passed inspection, mm -hmm. and they were able to do that, but that took time. And that was really the delay on this building. So it wasn't a deviation per se, um, and so they did a better job, um, the, the former subcontractor, but um, there was issues with the what we call the um, exchange of, of the material or chain of custody. OK. Uh, was it could, the same contractor as Villa Park? I'm sorry? Was it the same subcontractor? Correct. It was. Okay. Yes. If I could add if I could add to this conversation, I would encourage you to look at the video if you have not. Uh, that where Mrs. Moffat was uh, asking us questions, uh, Scott and I, Mr. Harvey and I, questions. Uh, the uh, conversations and the work at the site were taking place daily. So every time that there was something discovered, the contractor was notified and communicated with uh, by the next day. So what had transpired was months of conversations daily with the contractor to remediate the problem. We didn't wait until it got to 100. They were they were there was discussions on a regular basis, daily basis with that contractor. And it was the contractor's responsibility to respond and to uh, remedy the problems. And we did not allow them to move to the next step 
or accept the work because it was not according to the DSA approved plans. Uh, and, and that took a while to remedy until we got to the point of what Mr. Harvey was describing. Yeah, and and for those that know me, I'm, I'm not shy. So uh, we we definitely brought it up in every single meeting that we were in to make sure that we were holding the contractor accountable. So thank you for adding that, Mr. Rivera. So just to move on, is there any other questions about, are there any other questions about Villa Park in particular? Okay. El Medina, I think we've gone over that. There's there's one change order for El Medina, uh, El Medina so far. Um, so we're in a pretty low clip on that. There are others coming. Uh, we're catching up on that, but um, we still believe this will be well under 5% in the in the end, uh, probably around 3, 4% if, um, if I had to guess, because we're so far along. Here's some pictures of El Medina and how it's, it's coming along. We're getting to the point where we're close to lathing the building and doing the roofing, um, which means when I say lathing means that the framing is complete on the exterior of the building. It's ready to be wrapped with um, with the waterproof uh, paper and then um, or the material, I should say, and then the roofing would be um, on and this building would be considered dried in. And that's our hope to get through dried in status um, by the end of February and start working um, inside the building on an accelerated um, rate. OK. Canyon High School, I talked about Canyon High School and our topping out. So you can see a picture of the, the beam actually being hoist into place and our contractors there. Um, it has uh, nine change orders. Uh, a lot of that has to do, and you would say, why do you have so many change orders if this building is you know, in the infancy stages or halfway through in this case? Um, it's because of the unforeseens that we found um, at Canyon High School. Uh, if, if some of you know Canyon High School, um, the area that this building is being built was the quad area. So it's really the open area on campus that, you know, anyone that was fixing anything or running major line from either Imperial um, Highway or another uh, from Santa Ana Canyon Road, uh, which are the bordering main streets, uh, that's where the utilities are. So they're coming up through, in many cases, through that quad to the remainder of campus. And uh, they weren't as, they weren't placed where they were shown on the plans and that created some problems. Also, there's mit mit uh, mitigation with the soils. Um, if some of you also know the soil in Anaheim Hills, especially around Canyon High School, it's a heavy clay. So you can pour as much water as you can on it and it will not um, settle into the soil. It does not permeate. So in a lot of cases, this water has to be mitigated off the site. Um, and you know that that took some money and time to do. So there are some there are some time delays and the total project, but it is, uh, and that's the end project because this project doesn't encompass only the building, uh, the science building, but also encompasses a remodeling of the administration suite that's there now to accommodate a new kitchen. But we have an interim kitchen in place, so that um, is not as big of an issue of getting the building together. So it's our hope and, and uh, our, we're tracking still that this building would be open in fall of 21. Um, and that's still our, our kind of marching order forward without um, putting in any acceleration. The contractor is doing a great job of uh, keeping on track now that the steel is topped out and you may see some framing at the site and now and you may see some um, other activities such as plumbing um, happening within the building structure if you drive by. So here's some pictures of the inside of that building. Uh, you could see in, in retrospect, it's it's almost as far along and at least on the first floor as uh, Villa Park is. So it is making good strides and with the framing going up, it will go very quickly once we get to that stage uh, through that stage. Uh, going are there any questions about Canyon High School? OK, moving forward, our phase two update, um, you know, as as you may imagine, you know, we we've tried to keep 100% on track with phase, with phase two, but we, we have had some challenges with uh, full agendas and things like that during COVID-19's pandemic. So um, in some cases, some of the presentations were a little bit delayed, but all in all, the schedule is still uh, on track and maybe by a few months, we've been uh, pushing that as we go because of those presentations and because of just the um, some of the changes that we've made based on um, internal conversations and some of the lessons learned really from phase one. 
So those are things that we're putting into place and making sure that some of the things that uh, for, didn't happen in phase one, for example, very, very um, heavy facilities, uh, underground mapping, um, and also hazmat surveys and a lot more uh, detailed work is going into phase two to make sure that we um, adhere to those lessons learned. Okay, so right now we're in the presentations to the board phase, the last one, really the construction documents in some cases for Villa Park and for El Medina at least are, are just about ready to be um, taken into DSA. We're gonna be doing page turns over the next couple of months, few months I should say, on, on uh, these documents with the contractor as well as our construction managers. Our construction managers are currently um, performing constructability on those, uh, on those plans, which basically means that at 50% of the construction documents, which construction documents are the documents we're gonna present to the state, um, are reviewing those, those uh, plans for construct to, to make sure that they can be constructed and um, meet the budget, okay? So that's, um, that's underway now, and that's an ongoing process until we actually get our, our plans approved. So our construction manager will not so only- I know, Go ahead. Uh, I know a lot of the phase one projects were under budget. Are, is phase two capturing um, that excess proceed, the excess bond proceeds that can be spent yes. for uh, each school? Yes, yes, in, in most cases, yes. There, you know, we haven't really, um, we set a, a 5%, we, it was 10% and then we readjusted the budget to 5% and change orders for first phase. So there's still some money that could um, be on top of what we've already budgeted for phase two, but we kept that 5% line when going to um, the second phase uh, and budgeted from that point. If for some reason we go over 5%, um, we don't anticipate that, especially now that we've gone through, and that's why we were able to make that adjustment in the budget. But uh, for all intents and purposes, yes, that money is being, um, you know, rescheduled to be part of phase two. Um, Scott, along those same lines, um, with liquidated damages, will those funds roll over into phase two for Villa Park High School in El Medina? Well, unfortunately, when you have delays in a project, you have a lot of people that you have to continue to pay. So you continue to have to pay your construction management and you can especially you have to pay your inspectors to be on site. And that's an added cost. So a lot of that liquidated damages will go to pay our costs for those um, support staff uh, and also to cover the district, some of the district's costs and, you know, um, changing our dates for our uh, furniture deliveries and things like that that could have, you know, restocking fee costs and things like that. So that's the nature of it. Does that mean that all those costs are uh, necessarily are reached through our liquidated damage through our contract? It could be that we actually go and, and into a legal process and um, take it a step further and ask for additional costs, but that's something that would have to be determined uh, by our legal and I can't really speak to that at this point because we're not to that that stage yet. Thank you. So construction documents are will be um, put together over the the next they have been been put together over the next uh, few months. Um, they have been going on since September and um, like I said those documents I think the first one is going in on March 3rd I think is our, our first submittal date to DSA for the uh, Villa Park project. So Villa Park will be the first in um, with El Medina and Orange High School shortly behind and Canyon High School will be uh, submitted sometime closer to um, uh, the summer. Um, just because we don't wanna inundate that campus with construction before we were able to move the students out too. So we do have a little bit of time on that, but we are uh, diligent with the contractor and, or with the architect to get the, the plans ready um, but it, we're just trying to stagger so we're not overwhelming ourselves with bids and things like that. So, um, and Canyon's project will be uh, presented to the board. Uh, it says here February, um, and it's actually February 11th, which is the next meeting. So, DSA review will take place from uh, March, uh, like we said, all the way through August uh, of the year. And then we will start our procurement process over the summer into the fall. And then uh, over that time, you know, we'll determine what the bids are and what uh, the construction start dates will be. 
So that's my presentation. And uh, I will stop sharing my screen at this point, I believe. And then we can get into discussion or questions. Do we have any comments from any of the committee members? Any questions? Um, I do have a question about um, the financial report that's on page one of our December 2020 monthly progress report. Um, if you look at the total um, amount, the total budget, um, it looks like Canyon is getting significantly more than um, Villa Park High School. Um, $567,620 more. And it's just, it was very important to us when we were marketing this bond that we really communicated to the community that all the schools would get the same amount of money. And I know that with, you know, projects like this, you have a scope of work. And so the money kind of works out the way it works out. Um, but this just seems like a very large amount for it to be off. And in particular, in the Villa Park community, because they have always felt that our schools have always been put on the back burner when compared to El Medina or Canyon or Orange High School. And plus then Orange High School also got half a million dollars for their little theater, you know, outside of Measure S funds. But still, I could see where the optics on this aren't so great. So could you explain that? Yeah, and Mr. Rivera can chime in here too, but <clears throat> just to be clear, each site is getting 72 million. There's no change in that. Each each site is getting the equal amount of money when it comes down to it that was issued through the bond. There are some proceeds from from um, interest that Mr. Rivera could talk about and add on to that, that that may be the difference that you might be seeing that we, we may be using. Are you talking about phase two uh, mostly or phase one? Um, well, all of it combined. So yeah, I know that like really each school was really only entitled to 72 million. But if you look at the total amount for the budget, which right now stands at 291-603-902, um, then dividing that by four means that each school right now would get 72,900,975. So 900,000 in round numbers over the initial 72 million promised. So of that 72.9, you know, Villa Park, you know, is short 202,000. Orange High School is only short 35,000. Elmo is short almost 128,000. Well, Canyon is getting 365,000 and change more than that 72,900,000 figure. And just using round numbers. Well, without having the reports in front of me, the one of the factors that is computed uh, based off the usage is interest. So Canyon High School is the last school to be built. So when you set aside those funds, those funds are accruing interest. So everyone is so the first school that goes out, which is Orange, is going to accrue less interest because they were, were the project was started first. So I don't have the, those specific totals in front of me. But what we can do is bring back a report and show you an analysis of what is calculated for each of the schools besides the $72 million per the bond issuance, any residual interest, because that's where it would be coming from. There wouldn't be that there would be extra allocations. OK, so the extra interest that was earned per project goes into that individual school. So the fact that Canyon started later and earned more interest that money is going into their school, <laughs> not being divided four ways. Mrs. It's a large was, project yeah. too, so um, you, have yes. a, you have a larger if dollar amount too. Sorry, Jenny, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, if I may, um, when we uh, establish the budgets for each of um, the uh, schools, uh, schools, the four high schools, that's what we did. We separated the 72 million with different, uh, different um, allocations, accounts. So all the funds are deposited at the uh, treasurer's office and every month we receive, uh, you know, the total um, amount of the interest. But then we calculate based on the balances that each school has at the end of the month and we distribute monthly. 
So the interest, and that's the reason why a Canyon, because it started last, will have more interest, it has accrued more interest since we started, uh, you know, uh, recording all the, the interest, but it's done monthly. So we could, like uh, Mr. Rivera mentioned, we could bring forward, you know, a total report by um, a school year of how much interest each uh, school has earned. Okay, well, I don't know if that's necessary. I mean, your explanation makes total sense. So thank you for that. No problem. And what I was mentioning is that the cost of Canyon is the highest in that in the phase one project. So the interest would be higher than the others as well because of the amount of that of that uh, piece as well. The whole project. Any other questions in regards to their presentation or otherwise? OK. We're back to agenda. You're muted. Thank you very much. That was a, a nice presentation. I encourage all of the members, if you have the time, to watch the um, video with Kathy Moffitt. Um, it's, it's very educational. I think it might answer, just kind of clarify a lot of questions if you haven't watched it yet. So, uh, and if you see anybody in your community, I would also encourage them to watch it also because there are a lot of questions and a lot of misnomers out there. All right. Okay. I just want to raise my hand on one thing because yes. I forgot to at the beginning, and I know this is a public meeting, but I also would be remiss if I did not welcome back Shay Brown, who uh, his, was on maternity leave during a couple of these meetings. So I want to welcome Shay back. Um, she has a wonderful um, baby daughter named Anea. And uh, so, Shay, I don't know if, if if she wants to go on camera because she's probably, you know, taking care of her. But um, I just want to thank Shay for all that she's done and coming back. Um, there she is. Oh, there's Anea. Uh, what's her name? Her name is Anea. Anea. Anea yeah. Bellicera. She's oh, adorable. Bless her. Look at that. A fabulous name and a very cute baby. Uh, Shay shared with me today some Valentine's Day pictures that, you know, I, you know, I could, none of us could ever look as good as this, this child looks. So, um, congratulations, Shay, and welcome back to the process. And Shay did a great job putting tonight together. So thank you to uh, her for that. And thank you all for, um, for um, responding to her and for being so kind. So thank you so much. Thank That's you all. all. Wonderful. Okay, so at this time, what I'd like to do is open up public comment. Um, once again, for anybody who has joined our meeting, since it started at 5.30 or anybody who possibly has emailed or or put a comment through. Uh, Scott, is there any public comment that has come to you? you, you yeah, I'm sorry about that. I'm going to defer to, um, I believe Hannah Brake is on this line or Shay that's checking the form. Do we have any comments since the meeting started? We don't and I've been checking throughout the night, so we do not have any public comment. Public comment. But I'll just say for, for the recording's purpose, anyone who's watching this can can use that comment form. We'll leave it up for a few weeks so that you could potentially add comments in about this. And please keep this to this this committee's uh, business if possible. And uh, we will respond back and then we'll share those responses. And anyone from the committee that, um, you know, wants additional information can ask that at that time as well. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I have a question. Um, on the new the dates of which we are going to be meeting i happen to mark them into my calendar and as i was looking at it this is wednesday right <laughs> the next four dates are on thursdays was that on purpose it used to be a thursday meeting oh. uh, or or was it always a wednesday meeting so i think we changed it to thursday because our okay. board meetings we change it to every other week that our board meeting is meeting okay. so in some cases, we wouldn't have um, it on the same day or the same week where we had a board meeting and a COC meeting. Sure. But if Wednesday is a better date, we could adjust those and and bring it back for a new vote. Um, if I'm that's the date was, where they're I just wanted to make sure everybody understood. It's confusing when you're meeting on a Wednesday, but then the next three dates are on another day. And I just wanted to bring that up. Thank I you. Think yeah, I think. It was always our intention to have it on a Thursday um, because it gives us some time then to the weekend for you to get the information beforehand as well. 
but it was always coinciding with the board meeting. So what we did was we um, just did it every, you know, the the the, the week after the board meetings. Um, that way Makes sense. Um, you're able to get some board information too. And it's kind of coinciding with that schedule. Thank you. I'm sorry, Deanna. I just wanted to bring oh, no. That was a good point. Very good point. Okay. Um, is there any uh, committee member who would like to put something on the agenda for next time? Well, Madam Chair, uh, we yes. skipped over the uh, update on the vacant business rep. Number. Oh, you're right. Thank you. Sorry, I was going to mention. I was going to mention at the end. So I'll I'll give you an update on that. It's it's pretty it's it's pretty uh, short. But basically, we've in um, uh, you know over over the. I guess the first one was done in October. The outreach started in September, actually, uh, was the first outreach for this position. Um, it was tough because, it, you know, in the pandemic, you don't have the chance to have a lot of in-person meetings where people word of mouth can invite someone to be uh, in this position or apply for the position. So we sent it out to uh, Chamber of Commerce. We sent it out to individuals that this group had asked it to be sent out to, as well as, um, other groups within the community just to make sure that it got out there. We also advertised it in the paper and um, we didn't have any applications turned in in um, late October. So then we sent it out again in November and gave it till I believe it was um, till almost you know mid December for everything to be turned in and we did not get any applications through that process as well. So what we'd like to do at this point is is um, you know take that out again. Um, now that Shay is back, she can help me um, do the outreach again, and we'll start that with the with the OK and direction of the of the committee to send that out with the same process again. And then just would encourage you to, um, you know, if you have people that you know that may want to be involved that are in that um, in in the business category that could meet the requirements, uh, and those requirements for those that may be listening outside of this group are that you are actively involved in a business organization within the community. And when we say actively involved, we mean that you um, are in an organization you belong to, like a chamber of commerce. Um, you belong to a group that can um, share your business with others and, and are active in that type of community. So that's what we're really looking for. And that's what the statute says um, should be the position for um, the business representative that we're looking for. I'm confident that someone once the COVID starts to ease up, which might be a little bit longer than we, we expect, but um, in the next four months, we should be able to find somebody as things well, try to get back to I'll, I'll be talking to a couple of members in my Rotary Club to see if they might be interested in something like that. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say Rotary Clubs would be, Kiwanis Clubs would also be good places to ask because those are usually business members of the community. And we did send out to Rotary as well. So I just want to clarify that too. But I know, was told by a Kiwanian, uh, Kiwanian, Kiwanis is an Indian word meaning I wish I was a Rotarian. <laughs> <laughs> so, let, let me go back to a serious point though. I, I wouldn't have defined Rotary or Kiwanis as business organizations. Uh, no, so, and that's why I said Chamber of Commerce, more or less. Right. Um, it's an active uh, business organization. There's a lot of lot of yeah. uh, cross currents in there too, though, that between the two. Well, oh, I understand that, but I, I am told, uh, yeah, for instance, I'll be on my Rotary Zoom call tomorrow morning. I'll let them know, but it isn't a matter of being a member of Rotary or Kiwanis does not qualify you for this particular position was my understanding. I've asked about it. Yeah, but they're not okay. mutually exclusive either. Right. No, no. And we in this in this process, we have our legal counsel that works with us. And if we have questions on an applicant, um, we will take it to our legal counsel to make sure that it meets with the statute. Very good. Now, there are some of these networking groups, too. And I don't know whether they would qualify or not. So that's an interesting one besides the chamber. Yeah. So I have a friend of mine that's in We Tip and uh, yeah. some other organizations like those. Well, and that is a business organization. And if they're if they have a business that's local that's active within that group, then that that could be um, a qualifying person. Very good. Where would I find that video from um, Kathy Moffitt? 
We sent you an email with the with the link, but I will resend it to you in the morning. Or Shay, can you send it to you? Thank you. Because I couldn't find it on your website. It is on the website if you look for Villa Park update. Um, it has a clear Villa Park update, which is um, I believe it's January 2020. Is that correct, um, Shay? On the website or, or Hana, if you're there. OK. Well, it it's should be on. To get it off your email. Yes, yeah, so it should say Villa Park update, though. Yeah. All right, very good. Uh, for January of 2021. All right. All right, so now I'm going to move on to 11. Thank you for telling me I missed 10. Are there any items you would like to put on the agenda? Nicole, do you, would you like to see uh, an itemization of the interest on the next agenda? Oh, no. I think, okay. you know, yeah. No, Jenny and Dave answered my questions, and Scott, thank you very much. Okay. All right. All right, well then, not, not saying anything different at that point, our next meeting is going to be in April, and we'll proceed with the normal um, agenda items that we have here, and Scott will be in contact uh, regarding the board meeting in March. Very good. Okay. Thank you, thank everyone. You. Be safe for the next few months. Look forward to seeing you all in April. Thank you. Thank you all. 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 Thank you all